morning and welcome to this special Easter Chapel time of worship. Join with me as we begin. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus, vast, unmeasured, boundless, free, rolling as a mighty ocean in its, in its fullness over me. Underneath me, all around me, is the current of Christ's love, leading onward, leading homeward to his glorious rest above. The powerful hymn, Oh, the Deep, Deep Love of Jesus, profound lyrics that we'll sing in just a few minutes, a hymn sung at my father's memorial service just 14 years ago. Let's pray. Lord, it seems that you are so madly in love with your creatures that you could not live without us. So you created us, and then when we turned away from you, you redeemed us. Yet you are God, and so you have no need for us. Your greatness is made no greater by our creation. Your power is made no stronger by our redemption. You have no duty to care for us, no debt to repay us. We understand that it is love and love alone which moves you. Lord, this morning, open our tired eyes to glimpse anew the depth, all-encompassing and radical love you so freely bestow. And I pray this in the great name of Jesus, the lover of our souls. Amen.
Jesus went out to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him, and being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. One's cup refers to a vessel containing one's portion, one's experience, what you suffer, what you love, what you feel and think. The cup is the metaphoric vessel, the place that holds it all. Think of the people you know and all the nations there are, and how deep and large their cups must be, how much they contain these unbelievably dense and complex, sordid and beautiful and painful histories, and how those cups, if we drank them, would fill us with sorrow and too much of everything to bear. Catherine of Siena, a godly woman who lived in the 14th century, when she felt revulsion for the wounds she was tending, bitterly reproached herself. Sound hygiene was incompatible with true charity, so she deliberately drank off a bowl of pus from the foul-smelling lesion of one of her patients. Jesus came to drink off our pus, as it were, those dark, dense, deep cups that contain bitter liquids, what a stomach Christ must have. What a tolerant constitution. The events of Christ's passion suggest that Jesus drinks all of our cups down to the very dregs. There's a moment in the garden when Jesus doesn't want to drink this cup, but he does. His ferocious love drinks it all up, and it's dramatic. What he suffers, it seems, is the very life of the whole world from beginning to end. Then graciously in return, Christ offers his cup of salvation for all of us to drink. What rich and wild blood is Jesus pouring? What sort of nourishment does this cup transport? What sort of disease-fighting substances? What kind of abundant life? We are told there is no life without the blood. Jesus says, my blood shed for you. And whatever he meant by that, seems vital to our well-being. So what happened on the cross is something like a guilty defendant going free, something precious being rescued, a heinous enemy being loved, a battle against death and the satanic forces of hell being won, a once and final sacrifice being offered up so that no one ever has to provide another one again. The powers of death and destruction have been defeated on the most epic scale imaginable, and we are invited to see our cups in the context of a far larger story, one that includes the redemption of all creation.
Sing with me, would you? When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain. line for a moment in your heart, poor condemned on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, say Offer them to the Lord right now. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow. Such love and sorrow me, or thorns compose so rich a crown. Were the whole realm of nature mine? Were the whole realm of nature mine? That a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, let me have the share of your estate that will come to me. So the father divided the property between them. In this parable, the younger son demands his half of the father's inheritance early, and the father unexpectedly gives it to him. This unusual request means only one thing, that the son cannot wait for his father to die. The son's leaving is a drastic cutting loose from the ways of living, thinking, and acting that have been in place for generations. This was full-blown portrayal. The younger son left for a distant country where he squandered his money on a life of debauchery. When he had spent it all, that country experienced a severe famine, and now he began to feel the pinch. So he hired himself out to one of the local inhabitants who put him on his farm to feed the pigs. And he would willingly have filled himself with the husks the pigs were eating, but then he came to his senses and said, how many of my father's hired men have all the food they want and I'm dying of hunger. I will leave this place and go to my father and say, 
Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer de deserve to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired hands. As the prodigal travels home in shame after burning through all his father's money, he rehearses the speech he'll recite. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And the prodigal's older brother with venomous hatred agrees with him. How dare you show up all weepy and repentant, you jerk, after squandering our estate with prostitutes and potheads and losers. How can you conceivably expect us to take you back? As far as I'm concerned, you're disowned. But while the young man was still a long way off, his father saw him and was moved with compassion. He ran to the boy, clasped him in his arms, kissed him and said to his servants, quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, put sandals on his feet. Bring the calf we have been fattening and kill it. We will celebrate by having a great feast because this son of mine was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and is found. The son never expected to be the recipient of such radical love. It is utterly shocking to him when his father demands royal treatment. Robes and rings and sandals are signs of a, being a son. Although he's decided he can't be a son anymore, his father is crafting a different story, a story about return, reconciliation, forgiveness and redemption. My son who was dead is alive again. He who was lost has been found. In God's economy, people get what they don't deserve. Celebrations are thrown for younger brothers who squander their inheritance. It's a story with the sure and certain truth that we are loved, that in spite of whatever has gone horribly wrong deep in our hearts, in spite of our sins, failures, rebellion, and hardness, God is patiently waiting for us, longing for our return home. More than any other story in the Bible, the parable of the prodigal son expresses the boundlessness of God's deep, compassionate love.
Amish don't teach their children about forgiveness in a formal way. They don't have a curriculum on forgiveness. Amish children see their parents forgiving or, or extending forgiveness, and that's how they learn. The Lord's Prayer is one of the first things that a, an Amish child memorizes and learns to recite. They hear Jesus saying, forgive 70 times seven. And one Amishman said to me, that would mean if there's 490 victims, we keep on forgiving. But on October 2nd, 2006, in Pennsylvania's Lancaster County, a 32-year-old milk driver named Charles Roberts was about to put the Amish belief in forgiveness to the ultimate test. In a tiny schoolhouse in Nickel Mines, Roberts, who had been troubled by his own past, opened fire, killing five Amish girls and wounding five others. The Amish have a, a profound ability to absorb adversity. Uh, they have a strong sense of yieldedness to God, uh, a sense of acceptance uh, of whatever comes, to not argue with God, uh, to not debate or fight with God, to not get angry at God. As the families began to recover from the horror, uh, they said, well, you know, we need to go over and talk to the Roberts family and make sure they know we're forgiving them. So it, it wasn't a matter of rational decision making. It, it was more habitual. It, it's um, woven into the fabric of the culture. It's woven into the fabric of the faith that this is what you do. And so I think one element of this that enables the Amish to forgive is the strength of the community that they don't need to defend themselves individually. They don't need to retaliate. Uh, retribution is not part of their vocabulary because the community helps them absorb the hatred. The, the community support helps them to deal with the anger that they might have. 10 days later, the Amish elected to raise the schoolhouse in Nickel Mines. They could not allow their children to return to that site. But while the school is gone, the memory of that day and the challenge to forgive remains. It's not something you just do once and then it's done. Amish people, I, I remember growing up, but I've heard it said many times by my Amish friends in this incident too, is that we have to work at this every day. We know that we, every morning we wake up and all the emotions are there from anger to grief and pain, and we have to start over every day. During World War II, Corey Ten Boom, her elderly father and physically weak sister, were thrown into Ravensbrück concentration camp for harboring Jews. Corey was the only member of her family that survived. After the war, there was a man who came to Miss Ten Boom and identified himself as one of the overseers in the camp. He had become a Christian and had prayed for an opportunity to find one of his surviving victims so that he could seek their forgiveness. Corey said, I remember the incredible suffering of my dying sister through him and could only hate him. But after struggling with my feelings, I realized that Christ's love is stronger than my hatred and unforgiveness. At that moment, I was free. I said, brother, give me your hand, and I forgave him. You never touch so the ocean of God's love as when you forgive your enemies. The Amish teach that nothing bears the impression of Christ more than the act of true forgiveness. If you, in his sermon on the Mount, Christ says, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. On the cross, Christ cried out, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. As human beings, we are in need of God's forgiveness, as well as the forgiveness of those in relationship with us. This morning, the Biola community mourns with a sister institution in Oikos Christian University in Oakland, California, where Monday, 
Seven staff and students were gunned down and killed by a disgruntled former student who had been expelled. We pray for the gunman, his family, and the families and friends of the slain victims, beseeching the Lord for his love and forgiveness at this tragic time of grief and loss. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your King. Every tongue declare your matchless worth, your awesome deeds proclaim. Hallowed be, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be, hallowed. from Satan's power in every way your name be glorified hallowed be hallowed be your name hallowed be hallowed for my soul, for my soul. What wondrous oh, love is this, love. oh my soul, wondrous oh my soul. Love. What wondrous love is this, oh my soul, oh my soul. What wondrous love is this, the Lord has lived to bear the dreadful curse for my soul, for my soul, to bear the dreadful curse for my soul. Wondrous love, wondrous love. Christ laid aside his crown for my soul, 
for my soul. When I was sinking down, sinking down, I was sinking down. When I was sinking down, oh my soul, oh my soul. Christ laid aside his crown for my soul, for my soul. Christ laid aside his crown for my soul. To God and to the Lamb I will sing, I will sing. To God and to the Lamb sing, I will sing to God and to the Lamb, who is the great I am. While millions join the theme, the theme, millions join the theme, join the theme, join the theme. Join the sing on I'll sing on I'll sing on six days before the Passover Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. Mary took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of perfume. But Judas Iscariot said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Jesus said, leave her alone, for the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. Imagine this story in a culture where women aren't supposed to eat in the same room with men, and men aren't supposed to touch wet objects that women have touched, much less actually touch women, and where women were expected to wear their hair braided, always in public, unless they meant to advertise that they were a prostitute. Right before this, Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. The story takes place at a dinner. Lazarus' sisters Mary and Martha were there, Martha is dutifully behaving exactly as women were expected to. Women, Mary on the other hand, is washing Jesus' feet in a very unorthodox way. Imagine the scene. The beautiful smell of perfume permeates the entire room. While Mary does the forbidden, she lets down her hair and washes Jesus' feet in a room where women were not allowed to be. She is publicly showing affection. It's really an impossibly enormous amount of perfume that Mary pours on Christ's feet, worth what would be a decent year's wages. Think about $30,000 worth of perfume poured out at once in an enclosed space. This is beyond lavish. This is unreasonable. Everything about this is so far from prudent or careful or chaste or modest, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. However outside the bounds this was, Jesus clearly reads Mary's act as love and far from rejecting her gift, he gives it value she couldn't even known it had. She's not wasting perfume not wasting anything, she's anointing him for his salvific act, preparing his body 
for burial. What seems like a sexualized encounter becomes, in the context of John's gospel, the exemplary act of love, an essential glimpse into what it means to be a true disciple of Christ. What if being a disciple is an authentic response to being loved? And what if being loved actually feels like being loved? What if spirituality has something to do with the part of us that thirsts and hungers and cries out with passion? What if Christ's love reaches what is thoroughly and essentially human about us? God's love is connected to what we need to our guts, to our essential and primal humanness. And worshiping and loving God can be a natural, real, and unselfconscious response to His love, a genuine gesture of our entire being as His beloved. Well, let's stand and express our love to Jesus, shall we, in our worship of Him. My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. For thee all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior, Art thou if ever I love thee, my Jesus? Tis now, and now just the women. Just a man. I love thee in life. I will love thee in death and praise thee as long as thou lendest me bread and say. cold on my brow if ever I love thee my Jesus tis now everyone together in mansions of glory and endless delight I If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can even move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. 
if I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. For love is patient and love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast. It is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease, and where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things, put them behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. Amazing grace How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see, t'was grace that taught my heart. See? 
sing my God's praise. Then when we first begun, I once heard praise God, 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 praise God. And now to him who loves you and who has set you free from your sins through his precious blood. To the only God, our Savior, be glory and majesty and power and dominion now and forevermore. Amen. And he is risen. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.